here we are. Mr. Cat, the producer, said, look, Joe, people are bored seeing you in the middle of the frame. Let's try something different. So he stand on the side of the frame. I said, yes, Mr. Cat. Now, today we're going to talk about something again a little bit difficult, but uh, what's the point of doing a YouTube presentation if the concepts aren't difficult? It's easy to do easy concepts. I want to look at the, the changing role of class in Australian society in the 21st century and its influence on community, social and political attitudes in Australia in the 21st century. Because 19th century Australia is not 21st century Australia and 20th century Australia is not 21st century Australia. And unfortunately, most people who are activists continue to use phrases, ideas, strategies that are rooted in the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. Because there's really been no revision about the concept of class. What is class? And obviously in the past it was very easy, especially in a hereditary class society, to divide people in terms of ruling class and uh, working class. It was them and us. A very simple concept for people to understand because they live differently, they wore different types of clothes, had different types of experiences, different types of challenges. But the 21st century and the latter half of the 20th century has completely changed the idea of class, especially in a society which is not based on a hereditary division. So what we need to do is look at the reality that faces us and look at class in its various forms. Now I like to divide class into four distinct categories. Four distinct categories. And what type of work you do does not necessarily determine what class you're in, or what type of work you've done. Class is based on one thing in a 21st century capitalist private investment for private profit society, and that is disposable income. It's not based on the concept of capital and labour, the division of capital and labour, but disposable income. It's not based on the type of work you do, but disposable income. What's disposable income? Disposable income is the income you have at the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the year, which is surplus to your immediate needs. Mortgage, rent, bills, the list goes on and on. And what has happened in the 21st century is that certain types of work which never had a disposable income component, certain types of non-intellectual work have now disposable income. And that's the difference. The more disposable income you have, the more you tend to to adopt the ruling ideology that private investment for private profit is based on. And when I talk about class in, in four ways, the first class, and there is a hereditary component to this, is the 1% that own the means of production, distribution, exchange and communication. That 1% owns up to 60% of the resources in this country. That 1% has the economic power to influence the parliamentary agenda. And that's why we see, see simple things like a million children living in poverty in this country never addressed. Because obviously, that 1% that owns the means of production, distribution, exchange and communication, it's not in their interests to ensure that child poverty 
ends in this society. It's not in their economic interests. Then you have a new class. It's been around for a while, but this is a new class in Australia. And you enter this class by the amount of disposable income you have. Many of the people in this class have reached that position, not because of university degrees or intellectual endeavours, but because of particular trades. Some are work, some are self-employed, some are not. The stronger the union in industry, the better the return to the workers. And what happens is that we now see not just CEOs on, five million, on average $5 million a year salary, 55 times more than the average salary, we now see people who would have been defined as working class become part of the investment class. They may be tradespeople, they may be academics, they may be bureaucrats, but at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, they have disposable income which they invest in property, stocks and shares, and to a lesser degree in cryptocurrency, and to a lesser degree in banks in terms of interest rates. Now about 8% of the population in Australia are now part of the investment class. And they are the ones who have benefited greatly from the current privatisation, globalisation, corporatisation, deregulation agenda. They are the ones that have actually benefited the most in our society. Now, you can be a tradesperson, you can be a bureaucrat, well, a top-level bureaucrat, you can be a doctor, you can be an intellectual, you can be a university professor. But at the end of the day, it's not about the type of work you do, what class you find yourself in, but whether you've got that disposable income. Then you've got the great bulk of people which is about 60%. And the great bulk of people can now be described as working class. And many people who find themselves as workers are not employed by corporations or businesses. They are self-employed. Or they, or they are involved in micro-businesses. So Although people may be involved in a micro-business, they may even employ two or three other people, and although they may not, they not, may not receive a fixed wage, at the end of the year they have no disposable income to invest. So they are not part of that investment class. You have many professions now, many intellectuals, who are part of the working class because their wages have not kept up with the pressures of living. So at the end of the day, irrespective of what your work is, whether you're self-employed or employed by a corporation or employed by a small business, if you don't have disposable income, you're part of that class. And finally, we have the 32 to 33 percent of Australians who rely on social security benefits to survive. Now people on disability pensions, people on old age pensions, people on single parents pensions, people are, uh, receiving student allowances and the list goes on and on. Most of the people who receive social security benefit will never find themselves able to leave that particular uh, situation. Obviously many of the students will obtain degrees or trades and become part of a working class or part of the investment class and occasionally part of the 1%. So these are the four classes. So what does this mean? What does it mean for attitudes? And we see this day in and day out where people have, although they may be working with their hands, and receiving a good income at the end of the year, or the end of the week, or the end of the month. They lose interest in those around them. They lose interest in those who are interested in public housing. 
they lose who need public housing there they lose interest in the one percent in the million children living in poverty they are, have become socially mobile they are moving up the ladder and as you tend to move up the ladder you tend to acquire the same philosophical ideological position as those who are investors or the one percent who own the means of production distribution exchange and communication you aspire to become one of them that is the goal the introduction of superannuation has reinforced this concept many people think that through superannuation they will somehow live this glorious retirement their facts are very different most people who are part of the working class will never derive any significant benefit from superannuation the single most important thing that provides security is home ownership or access to public housing housing security not what's in your superannuation fund determines the type of retirement you're going to have superannuation for the majority of people is nothing more than a mechanism by which people pay for their own retirement obviously the one percent in the investment class can use all those superannuation friendly laws that have come through Parliament the last four decades to enrich themselves and ensure they have a exceptionally comfortable retirement so what does this mean for activists what does this mean for people who want change what does this mean as far as the possibility of change I mean I've been an activist for over 50 years almost 55 years and the single most important thing we have seen over that time is resignation and cynicism now Australians have always had a history of murmuring under their breath about things saying I'm going to do this and going to do that or somebody should do something about that or some or the government should do something never realizing that ultimately it's the type of activity that's taken by people like you and me which actually change things when you think about it most people I said before are resigned cynical they said to you what's the point you're going to lose well the point isn't whether you win or lose of all the activities I've been involved in I'd be lucky to have won maybe one to five percent of those campaigns but the reality is but if there's no resistance there is no change because there is no change in community attitudes the other issue we've seen as economic uncertainty increases is the tendency for people to look for quick solutions the strong leader to lead them out of the wilderness into the promised land it doesn't work like that and the other thing we tend to do is this resignation that you can't fight the system there's no in point point shrug your shoulders move on and something new that we've seen since the 1990s the mid 1990s the introduction of social media or asocial media or dysfunctional media whatever you like to call it is the fact that many people now see social media as the mechanism by which change occurs obviously social media can popularize very quickly certain topics but the dilemma is that as you know social media is dominated once again by a few corporations it's not some collective it is owned managed manipulated by once again by a small number of people and to restrict yourself to social media is the ultimate impotent you're totally impotent you can click a button all you like but the reality is it's only when people take to the streets that we see change because the state in this country enjoys a monopoly on the use of force and it will use that monopoly when it is challenged 
Now many people think they live in a three society. The reality is very different. Although we don't have to worry, or most of us don't have to worry about the knock on the door at two o'clock in the morning and people disappearing off the streets. The fact is, there is a legislative agenda in place which can be used to maintain the status quo. And we see this in a small way in the little battle that's happening in the Barrack Beacon Estate in Port Melbourne where one resident, one resident out of 260 has refused to move. And that's forced the state government in Victoria to take the matter to VCAT. And while waiting for a decision, this particular resident has been able to generate support, minimal support, amongst other people. And this minimum support has now attracted police attention and security attention. And obviously, if the FIGA decision goes against the government, they will appeal to the Supreme Court, and the list goes on and on. So what I'm saying to you is that when you are involved in struggle, it's not enough to rely on social media. It's not enough to rely on issue-orientated politics. During any economic crisis, and we have seen the beginning of an economic crisis in this country, issue-orientated politics begin to dominate. Because issue-orientated politics, whether it's gender, whether it's sexuality, whether it's race, culture, language, whether you're First Nations or not, in no way challenge the status quo. They challenged preconceived ideas that people have. They challenge, but they don't challenge the status quo. They don't challenge the inequalities which to a significant degree lead to this division in society based on what to a significant degree are not significant issues for the majority of the population. So what we need to do is not just be involved in identity politics, and there's nothing wrong with being involved in identity politics, but to remember that there is a bigger picture. And that bigger picture is based on inequality. Inequality in power and wealth. And if you move from class to class because of your disposable income, it's important to remember that it doesn't take long for somebody who has a disposable income to find themselves in social security. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen, and it does happen. Vagaries in the marketplace, see people who think they've got a stable future, see that future collapse. That is part and parcel of being an investor, especially a small investor, because most investment vehicles are dominated by corporations that manipulate the marketplace in order to increase revenue for their major stockholders. So when you're involved in a struggle, obviously class is important, but what is important is to remember that class isn't some ossified ideological relic. Class is dynamic. It changes as people's situations change. This is what happens in a demo uh, parliamentary democracy. There is that possibility for your financial situation to change. And as it changes, it's important not to take on the attitudes, the viewpoints, of the 1% that own the means of production, distribution, exchange and communication. Because that's what leads to robo-debt. That's what led to the harm that robo-debt created. That what leads to division in society. That what leads to hatred as far as differences in our society are concerned. And that's the dilemma. We face a difficult period 
fewer and fewer people are engaging with the political process. And I'm not just talking about parliamentary democracy, but I'm talking about extra parliamentary activity. The numbers are dwindling rapidly for a variety of reasons. Although some young people and now younger people are beginning to understand the situation they find themselves in, they're not able to afford rent, pay off a hex debt, plan a future, buy a home, are intrinsically linked to the structures that we have allowed to be created on our behalf by governments who take their marching orders from the 1% that own the means of production, distribution, exchange and communication. So don't forget how important feet on the ground is. Don't forget how important it is to participate in struggle. It's only through that participation that we will be able to change class structure and more importantly, even more importantly, change the attitudes which that class structure breeds, which leads to many of the issues that we face, whether we live in a major capital city, a regional centre or in the countryside. Think about it.